global energy markets have been remade in the last decade in large measure by fracking, reducing U.S. dependence on foreign markets as well as OPEC. When someone says they can forecast future prices, you should run the other way. Yet, like E.F. Hutton, when Dan Jurgen talks, people should listen. Hello, everyone. I'm Jim Falk, and today we are joined by Pulitzer Prize winning author Daniel Jurgen. His latest book is The New Map, Energy, Climate, and the Clash of Nations. It was published just about two weeks ago, and you can read a wonderful review in today's Wall Street Journal. In fact, if you look over my shoulder, you can see that I have quite a collection of Dan Jurgen books. Dan will be in conversation with one of our former directors at the World Affairs Council, Reg Manhas, and today he is a principal at Purcell Global Strategy, a consultancy. As always, I hope that you'll go to our Dallas Independent Bookstore in Terabang Books to purchase a copy of the new map, and you can always get a 10% discount for our viewers and members by typing in the code DFW World, not just on the new map, but on any books that might be in your shopping cart. Want to give special thanks to the sponsors of today's program. And let me remind you that we certainly welcome sponsors and you can be a sponsor by donating 500 or thousand dollars and just contact me or our office and we'd be glad to match you with a program that might be of interest. So the sponsors for the day are the Hoagland Foundation, the uh, firm Netherlands Sewell and Associates, the town of Addison, and special thanks to our media partner, the Dallas Business Journal. And we're so glad that their World Affairs Council is joining us from around the country, including Jacksonville, New Hampshire, New Orleans, and Orange County. And to learn about a World Affairs Council in your city, just go to worldaffairscouncils.org. I hope that you'll keep up with all of our programs. And if you've missed one, just go to our YouTube channel and type in the word DFW World to find our channel. And you can, of course, go to our website at dfwworld.org to find out, look at our full calendar. So as I mentioned, Reg is the principal of Purcell Global Strategies, and he has over 25 years of experience in the international oil and gas industry. He's worked with Talisman Energy as well as Cosmos Energy, managing very complex above ground risk in over 25 countries on five continents. Reg is Canadian by birth, a recent US naturalized citizen. I guess he'll be voting in a few weeks. He earned his uh, law and chemical engineering degrees from the University of British Columbia. Reg, look forward to enjoying the conversation. And Dan, again, congratulations on this great book. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Jim. Um, first, I want to thank the World Affairs Council and Jim for thinking of me for this uh, amazing privilege to have a chance to spend a bit of time with uh, Dr. Jurgen. Um, as mentioned, after spending 25 years in the international energy industry, I feel like I've lived some of uh, Dan's uh, books over, over my career. Um, before I start, I should introduce Dan. Uh, he's asked me to keep the bio very short, so I will. But uh, Dr. Daniel Jorgen is a founder of IHS Cambridge Energy Research Associates and vice chairman of IHS. Dr. Jurgen won a Pulitzer Prize in 1992 for his best-selling definitive history of oil, the prize, which you can see behind me on my bookshelf, and the new map, which I've got in front of me right here. This is his fourth book. He was awarded the United States Energy Award for Lifelong Achievements in Energy and the Promotion of International Understanding. He serves on the U.S. Energy uh, Secretary, sorry, Secretary of Energy Advisory Board and chaired the U.S. Department of Energy's Task Force on Strategic Energy Research and Development. Dr. Jurgen is a director of the Council on Foreign Relations and a trustee of the Brookings Institution. And Dr. Jurgen holds a BA from Yale University and a PhD from Cambridge, where he was a Marshall Scholar. Dan, thank you so much for spending some time with us today. Well, thank you very much, Reg. Glad to be on, and I thank you and Jim. And it's a pleasure to be back at the Dallas uh, World Affairs Council. I know what an important uh, role it plays in the city, in the region, and now we know nationally. And uh, your programming is so strong, and it's, it's a pleasure to be part of it. Fantastic, fantastic. Well, before we get into the book itself, I'm, I'm really curious in terms of after reading all of your books, you know, interested in the writing process for you. You know, how, how do you... How do you put these together? Um, how long did this particular book take? And 
you know, the vision at the beginning of when you began this process of writing the new map compared to where you ended up, especially with the, the events of, of 2020, the pandemic, the oil crash, all the things that we're, we're living through today, how were you able to incorporate those into the book? And maybe speak a little bit about personally how you were able to kind of juggle all, the, all those things. Well, it's, uh, it's always a challenge. You set out to write a book, you always think it's going to be easier. You say, this time it's going to be different, it's going to be easier, but it's never easier. Uh, you know, I started the book really thinking about just how supply chains were changing, uh, the growth of shale and how that was changing the map. And then also, and it became more acute as it went on, the changing relationship between China and the United States. I tend to write a book, um, just focus in on one part of it. There was no map for the new map. I mean, there was a general idea of doing it and let the material lead me. I'm always trying to find my way to narrative. I write longhand, which people regard as old fashioned, but you know, Charles Dickens wrote longhand too. So there's something to be said for it. And, uh, and obviously it evolves as the times evolve. So, you know, you get a structure in place. The book, part of the book, the theme was about disruptions of all kinds. And that's why we need a new map. And of course, COVID was the disruption that occurred as uh, I was, you know, getting ready to finish the book. And normally a book, you turn it in about nine months before it gets published. I was working on this in the second week of July when they took it away from me. It was still here in September, so it was a short time frame. But it, it gave me the opportunity to revise and work in COVID and the framework because it fit in and write a new chapter called The Plague about the world that we're now in. And then to reflect in different parts of the book, for instance, ride hailing, very important to the future of transportation. You know, it's not a great time for ride hailing to make adjustments through the book, but it, um, you know, finally they took it, you know, the, the thing that the, the, the clamp comes down when they finally tell you, if you don't give up with this book, we can't have an index because you can't change the page numbers. So that second week of uh, July, I, I said goodbye to the manuscript. Wow. So that was a pretty tight turnaround from end of July to publishing uh, mid-September. Yeah. The Penguin, was, Penguin was patient with me up to a point. <laughs> well, fair enough. Fair enough. Well, perhaps you can talk a little bit about the structure of this book. It's, it's interesting when you read the prize and the previous books, they tend to be more historical, you know, what's taken place in the past and the history of the industry and the characters and whatnot. This book is, is definitely rooted in the past in terms of where we've come from, but, you know, where we are today and, and where we're headed. And you, you've organized it in a very interesting manner in terms of the maps and, and you know, you've, you've arranged it kind of geopolitically. Can you explain a little bit how you sure. decided to structure the way you did? Yeah, well, that's an example. You know, as you're working on it, things just occur to you. They so, uh, you know, when I was a teenager, I actually did an interview with a writer named Ray Bradbury. He said writing is a process of pulling out rope from your subconscious. You sort of depend upon yourself, and it just emerged to me that the map was not just literal maps, but it's a metaphor for a world. And so, what's America's map? America's map revolves around the shale revolution. China's map. It arrived, revolves around China becoming a great power, its rivalry, uh, its dependence on energy. Russia's map uh, is uh, looking at Russia. Then, of course, the maps of the Middle East, which have a root in historic maps coming out of the First World War. And then it was just natural to talk about the future of transportation. How could you resist roadmaps to the future? And then finally, climate map. So that's, that's the structure. And, that's the themes that run through the book. Fantastic, fantastic. Well, you know, getting into the book, I mean, I was really struck by, you know, being here in Dallas now, the very first paragraph of chapter one, you talk about I-35 heading north of, of Dallas, and you talk about George Mitchell and, and the unbelievably consequential story of his career and his vision and kind of where it's taken us today. Perhaps you can, you can talk a little bit about how you start the book. Right. Well, it did seem to me, I begin the, and I said, let's go to where the story begins. I conclude the introduction, and that gets me on in the first chapter on 35E going north. And it was realizing that this one little, this well, it was the throw, last throw of the dice to see if, you know, you could finally, after 17 or 18 years, they could make uh, uh, hydraulic fracturing work. And, uh, you know, you go out of now, it's just a little enclosed, almost like a little cage. But it was that well that changed the world because, you know, part of the argument of the book is how much shale has changed the world in which people often in the United States don't realize how much it's happened 
and how significant it was. But it was just very important to go look at it and see it and realize, you know, and I know a lot of the people watching know this story, but to just see it and the contingency of history of George Mitchell had not been so obsessed and as his granddaughter said, so stubborn, you know, this wouldn't have happened. Other companies would have closed it down saying, this is not gonna work, let's forget it. The petroleum textbooks say it doesn't work. He stuck it out and um, it's the well that changed the world. Yeah, I mean, it's amazing to me being from the industry, how late the major players were getting into shale. I mean, it really was a story of small independence, you know, epitomized by someone like George Mitchell, but you've got the Continentals and of course, Chesapeake's of the world who really, took this and took it to the next level. And it was, the majors are, are only now getting in and perhaps it's even too late for them. Well, it is, uh, it is very, um, you know, these were entrepreneurial people who combined a belief, a confidence in stubbornness, perseverance, uh, who did it. I mean, there's a great story about Mark Papa uh, at uh, EOG, you know, just saying, oh my gosh, it's gonna be so much gas, you gotta go into oil. Well, how big's an oil molecule? Will it fit through, you know, the pores? And he says, go look it up in the textbooks. And there were no textbooks. No one knew the size of an oil molecule and they had to figure that out. So it was the independence, uh, that entrepreneurial tradition, the American, this US oil and gas ecosystem that exists, the majors come in, uh, most of them are in it, not all of it. Uh, and of course, Chevron and, uh, uh, and ExxonMobil have very big positions and I think are very committed and will make a big impact and that's, and they see that as an important part of their portfolio to have short cycle oil and long cycle oil to a lesser degree. I mean, BP's there, uh, Shell's there, uh, Equinor's there, I think the others and, you know, international, but it was shaped by the independents. But of course the independents are now needing to negotiate a new social contract with the people who provide their investment, the investors. Yeah, in indeed. Um you know, shale has been so consequential. I mean, obviously it's transformed the North American kind of calculus and it's been a huge job creator and, and you know, it's not, not without controversy in terms of environmental issues and fracking and the such, but can you talk a little bit about how, you know, shale in terms of the new map has really driven a complete change in how yeah. the international energy industry is yeah. kind of changing? Well, you know, um, it's been interesting for me, Reg, as I've rolled out the book and I've done interviews in the Northeast and other parts of the country, I'm just struck by how, you know, the degree to which people don't realize how consequential it has been. Uh, because it's not, first of course, the United States went from importing 60% of its oil, which was every president said, we need energy independence and it looked like we'd never get there. And, you know, we're more or less, you know, not exactly there, but pretty much there. The world, US is now the world's largest oil producer. What I remember, we had Ben Bernanke after he stepped down as head of the Fed talking at our conference, you know, several years, a few years ago. And he said that the shale revolution, he said, was one of the most positive, maybe the most positive thing that happened to the U.S. economy in the aftermath of the 2008 financial crisis, because it's been such a big source of business investment, over $200 billion going into factories uh, as a result. Very important for the Midwest, Michigan, Illinois, in terms of manufacturing, as you said, job creation balance of payments, tax revenues, but also what really strikes me and sort of got, for people don't realize so much in this country, but you've had a lot of international experience. You go to other countries, it's really significant that the US has this position and it, like the relationship with India is different and it gives the US a flexibility in foreign policy that just, it didn't have when it was importing 60% of its oil. No, no question. Um, you know, it's, it ha it's had a huge impact in, in your book. You talk about the map of the Middle East and you talk about the map of, of Russia. Um, talk about how, you know, U.S. exporting of, of gas through LNG has really changed the calculus with respect to the Middle East and, and with respect to Russia and specifically around European gas supplies and, and how that's pushed Russia in a, perhaps a different direction. Yeah, well, yeah, there's two parts to that. First, it is, as you say, it's very significant. I have a story in the book. Um, I don't use very often the I word, but, uh, and I didn't use it there, but it was, I was at a conference and the two speakers were Vladimir Putin and Chancellor Merkel of Germany. So I had the opportunity to ask the first question. So I was trying to ask a question about 
Russia diversifying its economy so it's not so dependent on oil and gas. But by accident, I mentioned the word shale, and Putin started shouting at me, uh, outraged by it. And you know, you look around, you get a little nervous when that happens. I mean, <laughs> you know, you know, you need sunglasses. You know, what's going on? Uh, but it's because he saw U.S. shale as doing two things. One, taking market share away from Gazprom in Europe or making the European gas market more competitive so that people have alternatives. And that's the issue that's on the table today with this battle over this uh, Nord Stream 2 pipeline that's very controversial from Russia under the Baltic to Germany. So there's that. It's a competitive position. And secondly, he sees shale as an adjunct to American foreign policy. And he believes that we are in an era of great power rivalry. And he is intent on Russia being one of the great powers. It's one of the rivals. And he sees this as a big benefit for the United States. So I think it really shows up uh, there. I think another place where it shows up, whether you support it, how Obama approached the issue of Iran, Trump approached it, if it's a Biden presidency, how he would approach it. The US position is very different when we are the world's largest oil producer rather than a importer of oil. Because the Iranians, and I have some quotes in the new map where the Iranians said when Obama put sanctions on them, they'll never work. The world can't do without our oil. It could do without our oil, uh, without their oil because of our oil and the scale of it, which built up so much during that time. So those are two examples of the kind of foreign policy impact. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's fascinating. Um, the other thing I really took away from, from your book, and you, you know, it's in your title, the, the Clash of Nations. And, you know, increasingly, you know, there's a lot of rhetoric in the media around Russia, you know, political um, discussion, but obviously from an economic standpoint, and you see in the Trump administration, the, the big economic rival, of course, is China these days. And uh, whether it's trade, technology, you know, the issue of Hong Kong, human rights, you know, China is, is looming ever larger. And how does energy kind of fit within that dynamic between the United States and China right now? First, let me say, uh, you're quite right. I, I'm glad you, you pointed to that because this book is about the change in geopolitics. I think on the bookcase behind you, you may have the commanding heights, the book I did on, on the global economy. Yep. And that was an era when we were moving towards open markets, barriers coming down, you know, globalization in a very classic sense. And uh, that's really changed. And you know, that was an era when American presidents talked about a uh, constructive relationship with uh, a changing China, or they talked about uh, engagement, positive engagement. You know, I'm here in Washington. You don't hear that anymore from either Democrats or Republicans. It's really about China is a strategic rival, great power competition. And I think it's something similar. You know, I quote some of the Chinese uh, defense documents, the same thing. So I think we're seeing a kind of fragmentation of globalization, which is gonna make it a lot harder for global companies to operate because their playbook is a playbook of globalization and openness. And you know, suddenly it's TikTok or it's Huawei or it's chips or things like that. And it could well affect energy. But the interesting side of energy is that US China has two sides to it. One side is China's deep concern about being dependent upon imported oil, which goes to the whole discussion I have about the South China Sea and uh, wanting to be less dependent, and we can come back to that. Uh, but they do worry about the, in the event of a confrontation over Taiwan, the power of the US Navy to affect their oil imports and they import 75% of their oil. The other side of it though, is that it turns out China is a very important market for US oil and gas producers. And as part of the trade deal, that Donald Trump made, uh, the Trump administration made with China just before COVID, uh, energy imports were one way that China was gonna fix that trade balance. And so uh, the US is importing, exporting oil to China, natural gas, but um, that's subject to politics, you know, and if the politics change, that could change. But right now the Chinese see that importing US energy as part of their economic strategy to deal with the, with the tensions. But the other thing is that China is doing is diversifying. And the big diversification path is, of course, its relationship with Russia. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, indeed, I mean, there's more pipe being uh, that's going east-west these days, it seems, between China and, and Russia and Turkmenistan as well in terms of gas supply. And uh, 
um, obviously must fit the agenda for China in terms of not only energy security, but, but pollution. I mean, that's a big issue yeah. in China in terms of the air policy. Yes. yes. I think that, um, you know, China, uh, President Xi Jinping made a statement last week uh, to, at the UN about China in the year 2060 being net carbon zero. I think we have to remember when the Chinese talk about climate, they're not only talking about the way it's talked about in this country, they're talking about in terms of urban pollution and the social contract with this growing middle class to reduce the pollution. And so that's part of their climate agenda in a way that's not uh, here in the United States. Indeed. Well, I've got a few questions here, which uh, perhaps are a bit of a non sequitur, uh, Dan, but I'm going I'm to put them out there. Um, we have a question. Please comment on the importance of rare earth minerals to the development and use of alternative sources of energy. Will their location, will their location change the new map? And will well, their exploration have their own negative impact on the environment? Well, I know, uh, and Rich, I know that's a subject that you yourself are working on. Uh, but um, yes, I think, well, rare earths may not be rare, but where they come from, it's China, and they're uh, part of that uh, supply chain for uh, renewables. Uh, and it's, in you know, I talk in the book that it's not just rare earths, it's also 70% of the world's solar panels roughly come from China, another 10% from Chinese companies that are elsewhere. Uh, the Chinese dominate the lithium uh, ion battery supply chain. So I do think that, uh, and that's one of the things we're working on uh, at IHS Market is what we call the new supply chains for the low carbon economy for the zero carbon economy, zero carbon. zero carbon, which is the goal for many have for 2050. And, uh, and so I think, I think there's an awakening to the fact that on the one hand, you're gonna need these new supply chains over here and they're gonna to have to be much, much bigger, but over here is the geopolitical side and these two things are gonna to come together. So I, th and then, you know, people are gonna examine from a, what's called an ESG perspective, those supply chains too. But you look at the scale of what would be required to attain these goals that countries have uh, set out. And I, it's not measured in terms of materials at all. I mean, and that's what we're trying to do. And, you know, I think a lot of people watching this will know this phrase, big oil, which has been around for decades. And at least in the new map, I said, you know, maybe as we move into these uh, new supply chains, people will be talking about big shovels as the, uh, as uh, the next stage in terms of underlying energy development. Another question here, what future do you see for nuclear power? Um, you know, it depends where. Yeah. Germany, no future, they're shutting it down. But in the same time that Germany has shut down its nuclear power, China, as it's been shutting down, China has more, added more nuclear capacity. And you see it in uh, emerging markets of the use and you see Russia and uh, China becoming suppliers of conventional nuclear technology to other countries. Nobody's gonna build a new conventional nuclear power plant in the United States, the cost, the regulatory process, the time it takes. Uh, it is still about 20% of our electricity. And you look at California where they've shut down their base load nuclear power and you see what happens rolling blackouts and uh, where they don't have the stability of the system. What really struck me uh, when I was researching it though, and this is part of this great sort of research machine that is the United States, as near as I can tell and count, there are about over 60 research projects, companies, et cetera, trying to look at the next generation of nuclear power uh, or the next generations of nuclear power to have it to be part of the system. And, uh, um, uh, you know, so, and I think that's, Part of the agenda, you say, what are the technologies we need if people do want to get to net zero carbon? You sure need nuclear power. And you also have to think twice about shutting down your existing nuclear power, I would say. Yeah, no, it's a real contradiction. Uh, maybe that, that's an interesting segue to a, to a question I had. When you think about all the themes in your book and, and the kind of cross currents we're facing right now in terms of climate change, energy supply, um, technology, regulation, California seems to be kind of a microcosm of all those forces and currents going on. You've got Silicon Valley, you've got Tesla, but you've also got the new, you know, um, desire to get rid of internal combustion engine sales by 2035. You've got climate change uh, related fires. 
how do you kind of see where California is trying to go and how they're gonna how they're gonna get there? Well, California set the goals, you know, to be uh, net uh, net zero carbon. Uh, we have a picture of Tesla in, in the book. There's a picture next to Tesla is a picture of, of Thomas Edison standing next to his car in the same posture and the sort of wonder of, you know, is Elon Musk the, the, thematically the reincarnation of Thomas Edison. Uh, but, you know, because and I have this, a chapter in the book about how Tesla did it and how difficult it was and how it all started over a fish lunch where the um, where the chief the guy who became the chief technology officer of Tesla was trying to convince Elon Musk to do an electric airplane and Tess, um, Musk wasn't interested, but uh, he'd mentioned electric car. He said, I might be interested in that. So, uh, um, so I think California is, and the, and the governor just set this target to stop the sale, no sales of uh, internal combustion engines after 2035. I think, again, it's based on the assumption that uh, all the system is there to do it. And you know, my estimate in the new map is that, based upon our work at IHS market, is that a global car market that today, the car fleet, 1.4 billion cars by the year 2050 would be around 2 billion. Uh, about a third of them would be EVs or, or fuel cell, but uh, two thirds would still be running on oil, but uh, 60 to 80% of new cars being sold would be uh, you know, new energy cars. So California, but you know, it, at the same time that California is announcing electric cars, it's having this volatility and brownouts in its electric power, which has caused some people uh, to scratch, scratch their heads. But of course, what California does do has a big impact on the rest of the nation and the world. It's 11% of the US car market. Yeah, no, it's incredible. I mean, um, you know, renewables uh, at this point still require that, that kind of fossil fuel backup. And it's been challenging to see how California Kind of manages all those all those those cross currents. A number of questions here related to financing and ESG, and you know I'm really struck by again being a veteran of the industry. You know, 10, 15 years ago, S and P was I think almost 20 percent made up of oil and gas. I think today it's around four percent and perhaps dropping every day. Um, what do you see the role of kind of investors and, and banks and, uh, you know, kind of ESG pressures playing in the fossil fuel sector. And, and, you know, is the industry just on a continual path downwards in terms of ex its exposure and the, the risk, you know, in terms of uh, ESG, or is there a way for the industry to turn itself around? And, and is, many, is most of it just a function of a long-term view of oil prices? Well, I think that um, you brought in, it's, it's the two things, it's the economics. I mean, You've had two price collapses since 2014. The returns from the industry haven't been very good. Uh, obviously, shale producers need to, you know, rebuild their relationship with uh, investors. And at the same time, you have the growth of ESG, and there's no question it's, it's growing. Uh, the financial side of IHS market, we have a thing called the ESG reporting repository because companies are getting very frustrated about all the different questionnaires they're giving, given and uh, that they contradict each other and so forth. Uh, and uh, but it's also a sign uh, that I think the ESG is just uh, continuing to grow as a as a as a framework, and I think the companies are having to adjust in terms of the sustainability. Some companies are making more radical turns, as we've seen with some of the European uh, energy companies. But I think um, I think uh, all the you know all the companies are uh, having to deal with that and uh, to show how what they're doing about. It. ESG. So I think it's, that's going to be a growing uh, part of the financial markets. And certainly, you know, some portfolios who say we just don't want to have uh, oil and gas uh, in it. But it, I guess that leads me back to why carbon capture is so important. Uh, because if you look at it, uh, a lot of oil and gas is going to be used in 2050, and it's going to have to be financed. And, you know, is it going to only be financed by Asian countries, or is it going to be financed by investors as well. Uh, and so I think that, you know, that focus on carbon capture is going to be uh, important for the future. Yeah, no, it's, it's absolutely fascinating. I don't recall a time where you've had such disparate kind of strategies amongst the, the big international oil players you've got. From oh, I think that's true. I, I think you're quite right. You've never seen yeah. such a difference. I think part of it has to be where you live, so to speak. Uh, if, you, if you're based in Europe, you're feeling different pressures than the United States. 
I think I'd urge anybody who reads the new map to read what Europe's doing mm -hmm. and how they're using their regulatory might to uh, pressure companies. The fines that European automakers will face if they don't make electric cars and you know, to just see if that's in Europe, does that stay in Europe? Does it migrate to the US? I think there are things in there that anybody who's interested in this really needs to know the global perspective because these are global industries. And uh, you know, we live in this after you know, Paris world, as I call it, after the Paris Climate Conference. Yeah, no, indeed. Uh, Dan, I've got a number of questions here related to the Middle East. I'll, I think I'll just pop a couple over to you and you can take it from there. So, was the OPEC plus oversupply timed at the start of the spread of COVID a strategic geopolitical move rather than an internal OPEC plus conflict as stated in the press? Second question, uh, do the UAE Bahrain deals have any impact on the future of Middle East oil? And one for me, well, where is Aramco right now in terms of its plan of continuing to, to go public? You know, they did a quite a right. small offering on the, on the local bourse. Well, so uh, let's see. So the first the second question was about the UAE. The first question was... The OPEC plus supply yeah, cuts. Yeah. Oh, right, right. Well, I, yeah, I mean, I, you know, it's interesting. Uh, the Saudi newspapers were very interested in my chapter called The Plague because I wrote about what happened last spring. And they thought, you know, it was very interesting to read what, what happened. I think it was a... Um, big misunderstanding between the two OPEC plus champions, Saudi Arabia and Russia. Uh, and I think it was a misunderstand and not understanding what was about to happen because it was right, right on the, just when they started, if some of you remember the market war, prices went to negative. There was that one day when the future price was negative $37. Yeah. Tells you something about the globalization because some of the big losers that day were retail Chinese investors, you know, which just you know, in U.S. futures. I mean, that's what the world is. Um, but it was just before the economic, what I call this economic dark age of the shutdowns uh, uh, came. And uh, the two sides, there'd been a change in, in people and uh, just, you know, shall we say, a very big misunderstanding about what the situation was. And then came the reality of uh, what actually happened and demand plummeting. Uh, not uh, 8 million barrels a day as it did when China shut down, but uh, ultimately 27 million barrels a day. And it was at that point when, of course, the Trump administration stepped in and did this remarkable thing, which really showed you that the world oil market now is the big three. It's United States, Saudi Arabia, and Russia, and brokered a deal that uh, you know people thought couldn't be done on a scale that couldn't be done. When I think people, you know, people realize what was actually happening, and you know, and what it would mean, and you know, how terrible it would be for, you know, for the domestic industry, which is why I've changed President Trump, who said, you know, I've always hated OPEC, but now, you know, I don't want to see this industry wiped out, um, and and so it, re, it it gave a rebirth to OPEC Plus, which for those who are not following it, it's the relationship between OPEC countries and a group of non-OPEC countries led by Russia to ag agree on a larger framework of, uh, of um, as you can see in the map, than had been the case uh, in the past. And that's what stabilized the market up till now. So I think now we sort of have OPEC plus plus, and the plus at least so far has been the United States, and we'll have to see uh, what next year holds. And uh, what about your thoughts on Aramco and where they're headed? Well, I think um, the Crown Prince uh, uh, Mohammed bin Salman has said that he, um, you know, he wanted to regard, I have a quote in there from him about, he wanted to regard Saudi Aramco as a financial asset, you know, wanted it to be listed, wanted it to be the biggest, you know, oil company in the world. Uh, I think in the, given the circumstances, they found that they, they were not able to do or did not want to go ahead with a global listing but rather did it in Saudi Arabia uh, in a relatively small share. I think the pot, you know, it's quite possible that, you know, I don't have any special knowledge that they would want to go ahead and do another, uh, an international offering at some later point. But right now, I think uh, like every company, they're dealing with what's happening with markets, they're mm -hmm. dealing with COVID, uh, they're dealing with keeping their own employees safe. 
So I would think that, you know, it's not something that's, you know, going to happen soon, but it is now has that sliver of being a, a public company. And that ties into the Crown Prince's uh, objective is to have Saudi Arabia have the largest sovereign wealth fund in the world, okay. bigger than neighboring Abu Dhabi and bigger, bigger than the number one sovereign wealth fund in the world, which happens to be Norway. Mm -hmm. Who are in fact trying to move out of oil and gas, it seems. Yeah, I mean, but they like having the oil and gas revenues to finance their-, their Norway, uh, Norway is an incredible country. The psychology of that nation is amazing in the sense that they are, they are very pro-climate and you, know, you don't see more Teslas anywhere in, in the world other than in Oslo, yet they, they receive such a, you know, their, their, uh, their income from oil and gas. You know, well, and it was, I, I asked a senior Norwegian, quite a senior person, you know, here they've done very well out of oil and gas, but you know, they have more electric cars per, per capita than anybody else. And they have an incredible range of subsidies and incentives to encourage people, you know, access and tunnels and just beyond the financial benefits of it. And, you know, if you buy a Mercedes, you pay a tax that I think could be equivalent to the cost of the car. If you buy a Tesla, there's no tax. So why would anybody not do it? So um, I asked him, you know, kind of, why do you, why are you, you just kind of, how do you do it? Or why do you do it? He said, well, it's, you know, we're a rich country. <laughs> or I think it's 4 million people with the world's largest sovereign wealth fund in the world. It's, it's incredible, incredible. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't raise with a, with a little bit of time, the kind of status of the US politics and you've got the US election, you've got uh, the debate tonight, um, you know, climate isn't on the agenda per se as, as a topic, you know, of, of, the, of the buckets that have been chosen for the debate tonight. But perhaps you can talk a little bit about energy in the current um, kind of election and the policy positions and really intrigued in terms of what's going on within the Democratic Party. I think it's pretty clear what the Republicans are standing for in terms of energy, but on the Democratic side, you've got a lot of cross currents. You've got uh, a lot, it's a big tent, and uh, maybe you've got some insights in terms of kind of where that debate and that dialogue is going within the Democratic Well, side. I, I think um, very clearly uh, it does in terms of uh, the Democratic Party. I think there's a division between, you might call it the pragmatists and centrists and those who want to go all out on climate. And I think Biden has a, uh, uh, a $2 trillion climate program. But uh, at the same time, I think he's a realist. And you know, he did say, I'm not going to ban fracking in Western Pennsylvania. And then he said, let me repeat, I'm not going to ban it. But I think you'd have uh, a Biden administration, at the very least, would have more regulation, I think, to expect that. Uh, I think that Biden was also chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. And I think he. Uh, will recognize the foreign policy uh, significance of this. And you know, before COVID, this is an industry that had 12.3 million jobs, very important to the economy, biggest focus of investment, capital investment, and all of those things need to be taken into account. I don't think they're very well recognized, and it goes back to one of your early questions, but, um, so, but a lot of them would depend on who, who's, who's appointed. So, you know, at this point, I think I would expect him to be a realist, but I'd also expect some very big battles within a Biden administration. And likely every cabinet will have a climate agenda there, given where the politics are. Yeah, I mean, you read that, you know, there's so much unity right now in terms of winning the election, but November 4th. Well, and, 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 and that's his, you know, and that's his issue. And we'll see it probably here tonight. On the one hand, he needs all those Bernie supporters he needs them to go out. He needs young people to vote. He also needs the independents and the centrists and how to, you know, kind of weave that net together is his political challenge. Yeah. My son is watching from Montreal. We, we have this discussion all the time in terms of how the Democrats reconcile Bernie and the more moderate positions. It's uh, going to be fascinating to, to watch. And, and, and I'll tell you, I tell you, um, you know, the, on the um, the people who want to go all out on climate, you know, they're kind of waging an internal battle within the Democratic Party to try and uh, discredit people who I think many people here would think would be, we might just describe them as realists. Yeah, I know no, exactly. Um, I've got a number of questions here, and it's a personal one for me as well in terms of, you know, my background uh, coming from Calgary. I've got a lot of great friends that are still 
working in the Calgary business and a lot of good friends here in Texas in terms of uh, oil and gas. And I've received a number of questions in terms of, you know, what is, what is the future of um, the oil and gas business in the United States? And I would extend that to Calgary and Canada in terms of oil sands and, and pipeline issues. And another question here, you know, very, very important question, you know, what advice would you offer to current oil and gas young professionals in an industry that is perceived as shrinking or stagnant? And that, that's a heartbreaking kind of question in the sense that, uh, you know, it's given us such an amazing career, but people are looking at it now and thinking, you know, is it going to be something that will be as fulfilling and, and uh, there in, in the long term? What are your thoughts on, on that? Well, I think it's a essential industry and I think it's going to continue to be a very large industry. Again, you just look at the numbers. I think people, you know, you know, car automobiles are only 20% of oil demand. Yeah. Many people think it's all of oil demand. They don't know that Tylenol is a, is an oil product. I mean, there's so, you know, and in a sense, uh, I think if you take plastics, you know, so essential to dealing with COVID in ways that people had not seen, but, I think that question's there. I think Canada, of course, its problem. Uh, I think the Canadian oil sands is doing a terrific job technically, technologically in bringing down its carbon footprint. It's a huge impact on that. Uh, we, we track it and it's, you know, it's competitive with the United States. I think it's become competitive with the United States, not well appreciated um, uh, at all. It's big problem is pipelines. And I have a chapter on pipeline battles uh, and one of them concerns a pipeline from Canada. Uh, and I have that great picture in the book of Obama in 2012, basically dedicating the yeah. lower third of the Keystone XL pipeline when gasoline prices were $5. But when prices are down, people don't think about that. So I think pipelines is a very big focus uh, for it. I think, the, I think shale, you know, our expectation, I just marketed for shale, is that you know we were, the country was altogether at 13 million barrels a day, will be between 10.5 and 11 million barrels a day at the end of this year, and we would start to see growth next year, middle of the year, as people are vaccinated, going back to work, uh, and volumes going up again. Uh, we have a debate. I doubt that the U.S. would get back to 13 million barrels a day. I think it would be more, uh, and the growth, we won't see the explosive growth, that incredible growth that was really a huge disruptive technology uh, over the last several years. It'll be more modest growth. And I think the sense is that shale will, as I say, not be a disruptive force, but it will be one of the major foundations in the global oil market. And it will continue to be there. And this position in the United States is very beneficial to the overall country, even if part of the country doesn't actually recognize that. I absolutely agree. All right, I'm going to try to get to a few more questions, Dan, if that's okay. Um, I'm just going to shoot them at you here. So do you see the present Azerbaijani-Armenian conflict being a prelude to what, to what future energy wars will look like, regional conflicts with global implications? Well, that's a very interesting, I mean, people may not be aware of it. This has really been a battle that's gone on ever since the Soviet Union. One of the unsettled questions of the a breakup of the Soviet Union, and it just erupted again. And of course, it could affect energy flows. I think, um, you know, regional conflicts, civil wars, uh, you know, civil disorder can certainly affect the flow of uh, energy. Uh, big one that a concern that I have and I focus on in the book is the South China Sea, uh, where which China has claimed as its own. And the United States and many other nations do not recognize that. And there have been several, I described several near collisions between US and Chinese naval ships. Uh, you know, that's an area to worry about and you know, how to deal with that when China's position is so strong. And I, you know, I bring out the story that people don't know how did China come to claim the South China Sea? And it goes back to the 1930s and the French when they had an empire there claiming islands and the Chinese geographer named Bay Meishu, uh, drawing a map in 1936 that became the basis of uh, the, what's called the nine dash line today. So that would you know, be something serious that could affect supplies, uh, obviously, in, in, a much, you know, in a much more dangerous way. So you know, I, I was just thinking in my mind of the map. I mean, clearly the Middle East is still uh, you know, 
there's a civil war in Yemen. Uh, the U.S. is just threatening to pull its embassy out of Iraq. Uh, uh, the standoff with Iran continues. Oh, and that goes back to that earlier question, actually, that, uh, that one of the people asked about the significance of the UAE and Bahrain recognition of Israel. And that's, I think that was really of historic importance, but because of what was happening in the United States, it didn't get the same attention it might have under other circumstances. But that ceremony there was really important uh, because it sort of broke a narrative, a, a three quarters of a century narrative. And there are many reasons for it, uh, one of which is Iran, uh, 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 which both Israel and UAE are deeply concerned about. I think it also has an oil dimension to it in the sense that uh, Gulf countries saying, is the United States going to remain interested in this region? Uh, and if it doesn't, uh, you know, from the UAE point of view, maybe they should have a, a relationship with a country uh, that is a regional military superpower, Israel. And, and if you remember those drone attacks a year ago on the big Saudi right. oil facility, Abqaiq, you know, that said something about vulnerability and the Israelis have very good technology. So I think it's there, it's economic, but it is part of redrawing a new map. You know, the UAE saying our, you know, the UAE is a country that has a minister of tolerance in its government, in its cabinet. Yeah. The UAE is saying, you know, we shouldn't be just with a frozen conflict. We have to, you know, build regional relationships. So I think, I think it's very significant. And, um, you know, Bahrain, is you know just adjacent to Saudi Arabia. I don't think, you know, this there's no indication that the Saudi Saudi Arabia opposed this. But I think it was a very bold step by uh, the UAE and Israel. They'd had contacts before, and obviously, but this formalized it. And you know, it's it sort of got shrugged. It got lost. That picture is really good, but it got lost in the in the other political news. But I think that will be seen as one of the important uh, turning points. Yeah. No. No. Indeed. I mean, I, I look back to, to a year ago, just over a year ago with those drone attacks in, in Saudi. And that, you know, I think that was what, 5.7 or 6% of global energy supplies taken offline. And, That's right. And, you know, and the lack of oil price response other than the initial reaction and then how quickly it dropped, um, you know, really showed me that the world has changed and people's perception of energy supply has changed. And you know, what are the geopolitical implications? And you could perhaps draw a line between that event and some of the things we're seeing today in terms of Saudis Kind of revised position vis-a-vis -vis conflict in the in the area. Well, I think that's that's true. Uh, you know, it also ties into uh, Saudi Arabia's relationship with Russia as part of OPEC Plus. I think you're quite right. You know, if that event had happened five years ago, we would have had panic Can in the imagine? oil market. You know, Indeed. panic, and it was almost like, okay, this happened. And I think that's also shows something else that I didn't mention before: the degree to which the this U.S. position resulting from shale has been a great contribution to energy security. You know, that that event, you know, you know, everybody geared up for a crisis and it didn't happen. And the yeah. Saudis did a very good job in repairing it and uh, putting it back, you know, pretty quickly. But, um, but, but it was still what an immense shock it was. I think there was a lot of skepticism as to how quickly Saudi would get things back online. And it, I mean, they defied every critic it seemed out there. Uh, amazing. A couple of really good questions here as we as we uh, get closer to the end. Um, petrodollar and the move to renewables away from oil, what effect will this have on the U.S. dollar as a global trade reserve currency? Well, that's interesting. Um, I'm not, I have to think about that. I mean, I think the position of the dollar, what's more important to the future position of the dollar is it can is the fact that sanctions have become such an important part of our uh, foreign policy. You know, when we don't, we're not sure what else to do, we put sanctions in place. And there's some countries led by China that uh, would take the lead in seeing if they could develop an alternative to the dollar. So I was struck that Jack Lew, who was the energy, uh, the treasury secretary under Obama, who led the sanctions that were put on Russia after the annexation of Crimea and the war in Southeast uh, Ukraine. Uh, you know, I have a quote from him in the book where he warns about if we overuse sanctions, we are gonna have people get off the dollar. 
and uh, or create an, the dollar will lose some of its primacy. So I think that's uh, the bigger risk. But I mean, till now, oil is generally priced in dollars. But you know, I'd have to look. But I think in the Russian Chinese relationship, I'm not sure if they only use the dollar. I'd have to look at that. That's fascinating. Well, I see I've got a question here from my good friend Ricardo from Galp in, in Lisbon. He asks, if the world is currently in a cycle of underinvestment in the oil and gas industry, do you think any future upticks in demand will be met with increasing prices or an accelerated shift to alternative energy sources, i.e. electrification, hydrogen? Uh, I think it depends on uh, what uh, uptick in prices. I mean, he's quite right to point out to the to, to drop in investment to international majors, their investments 30% lower than they had planned upstream than they had planned at the beginning of the year. The large independents, 50% or more. Uh, so that will show up in available supply. I think if you have prices respond, you know, $60, $70, of course, that'd be very good for the industry. Uh, you know, $55, uh, I don't think it'd have an impact. I think if you went into another period of what we saw in, uh, was it, 2007, 2008, you know, if we went over, it's like the 130 or something like that. If we went into that kind of price range, then that I think would lead to an ex effort to further, pardon me for saying this, step on the gas in terms of alternatives yeah. to, to oil. So it depends where that price goes. But, you know, one of the things I learned from writing the prize is, you know, they're all hundreds of characters in that book, but the two most important characters, one's named supply and one's named demand. Indeed. They're, they're, they're as current today as they ever have been, it seems. They don't get old. Um, the question here, expanding on your attention to Russian and Gazprom, do you have a reaction to Rachel Maddow's book and her thesis that in the aggregate, the oil and gas industry has been bad for democracy across the globe? A provocative question. Um, no, I mean, I don't think, I, I don't think you can, I mean, it's convenient to blame it on the oil and gas industry. I think that uh, uh, you have many authoritarian countries that don't have oil and gas. Uh, I mean, start with China. Uh, so, you know, I, I don't find that thesis compelling. Yeah, but let me put it that way. <laughs> no, it's, it's very well said. No. I think we're, we're getting close to where Jim's going to want to uh, to step in, but I want to kind of wrap up with a a question related to the kind of end of your book. I mean, the book is, as I said, it's not a retrospect, it's a, it's a retrospect current and then future look. And, and, you know, we live in incredibly uncertain times in, in every aspect of our, our lives, whether it's energy or uh, pandemic, uh, politics. Your, your book ends on a relatively, I would say, alarming note. You, you talk about the struggles over climate will be one of these challenges, but also in this era of rising tensions and fragmenting global order with the clash of nations. Can you talk a little bit about where you think things are going? Are you optimistic or pessimistic in terms of this, this, this potential class of nations and, and how energy can play a role? Well, I think that um, I am an optimistic person. I realize that it may, it, you know, what I was trying to do at the end, I just was thinking of all the surprises that have happened since 2000, the things that you just didn't see coming like COVID or, you know, uh, we can just go down a, a list of financial crisis. And, you know, or positive things, the pace of digitalization and so forth, that there'll be a lot more surprises coming. They'll come from technology, they'll come from politics, they'll come from economics, uh, uh, they'll come from health. But that um, the two big issues will be uh, climate and how it's dealt with and what the policies are. And the other big issue is uh, this clash of nations. And I think I meant the book to be a bit of a warning, actually, to, to people that, uh, don't, you know, don't slide, don't go down this slide without thinking about consequences. I mean, even what's going on now in Russia, I mean, China and the United States, I ask people in follow-up, well, where does it lead? And no one really wants to think about that. So, you know, my point is that China's not going away, the United States is not going away, it's complicated, but we've got to make it work and not, you know, not repeat what's happened in the past in terms of history. So I think that's, so I think the book is optimistic that we can learn from history and get a better outcome. Indeed. No, I think that's fantastic. Well, I always like to end on an optimistic note, so I think I'll jump in right now. 
Uh, Reg, thank you so much for the conversation with Dan. Dan, it's always great to see you, and I want to encourage everyone to purchase a copy of the new map, hopefully with our partner in Tarabang, but at your neighborhood, hopefully an independent bookstore. And want to also, once again, thank our sponsors, our financial sponsors for today's program, the Hoagland Foundation and Netherlands Sewell. It really makes a difference and we're so appreciative. To keep up with World Affairs Council programs, again, let me remind you, just go to dfwworld.org. Thanks again, gentlemen. Thank Have you. a great rest of your week.